असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 ओ लीड अस फ्रॉम दि अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस एंड टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी ओ पीस 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 गुड मॉर्निंग एंड नमस्ते एवरीबडी वेलकम ब्राइट एंड ब्यूटिफुल डे हियर Manhattan. Um, the subject you might have noticed is the honey of non-duality, and that sounds sweet, pun intended. But <laughs> what does it mean? It actually refers to a text um, called the Advaita Makaranda, a little-known text of post Shankara Advaita Vedanta. This text, the author was one Lakshmi Dhara Kavi. and it's little known i mean i had never heard of it when i was studying vedanta initially and i just read it only recently it was popularized um by swami dayananda saraswati from the arsha vidya the first translation i think into english was by swami tejo mayananda ji from the chinmay mission and then recently uh, our very own swami atmarupananda ji um who was in Houston now he's in Paris in the Vedanta center there he has translated this and he has uh, named it the nectar of non duality you can translate it either way the idea being here that the the author the author's idea is that already all these traditions exist the upanishads are very ancient they already exist and then the, the commentaries of shankaracharya are there and so many post shankara advaita masters have uh, written about it so there are many many texts now what this author his uh, vision is he is like a bee which goes to a honey bee you know which goes to different flowers all these texts are different flowers and he goes and he uh, extracts the honey you know like the, the they extract the nectar out of the flowers the bees and then they mix it together to make honey which they present to us so exactly like that this text is like the essence the sweet essence of all the other texts so basically what he has done is he has gathered insights and arguments from uh, various non dual texts over you know centuries or millennia so he's gathered it together into this honey of uh, non duality it's a short text um about 20 uh, 28 verses but it's very unique and there's a reason why i have selected it one reason one practical reason is that uh, i'm studying it all over again right now for the first time for the purpose of teaching it i've studied it myself for myself earlier but i am scheduled to teach this text later in september this year in in phoenix so i thought i'll give you a ta- taste of the honey you know <laughs> and take it for a test run in this uh, now this text it demands attention why it's a little different from all other texts and that's why it's intriguing and very interesting and sweet <laughs> in advaita vedanta the process is the method is hearing reflecting meditating shravana manana nididhyasana typically you would go to the upanishads and a number of other later texts to know to know an answer to the question what does vedanta say what what is vedanta teaching us and we learn from that we learn the central message of vedanta in advaita vedanta it's pretty simple actually i mean you can it's a vast system so many texts so many masters spread over centuries and millennia and yet it can be reduced to very simple um, statements you are brahman tattvam asi that thou art aham brahmasmi i am brahman brahma satyam jagat mithya jiva brahmeva napara brahman is the ultimate reality is only reality the world is an appearance and you are brahman you the sentient being you are brahman so this is you can state it in in very brief in in a single sentence you can put the entire teaching now the second stage after you you know what vedanta is teaching we know what vedanta is telling us that somehow we are brahman that we are the absolute reality existence consciousness bliss 
and then uh, we have questions. So when we have questions, we go to into the second state, uh, the second stage of Vedantic learning, Vedantic study and practice. It's practice actually. The second stage is reflection, um, reasoning. We try to answer the questions. For example, how am I Brahman? I don't feel like that. I don't see. I don't see at all how I am Brahman. It's impossible. So this this doubt, impossibility doubt. The, the, in Sanskrit, it's called asambhavana, literally impossibility doubt. It's impossible that I'm Brahman. It's just crazy. Now I have to be convinced. I have to be shown. I have to be uh, shown that I am in error of what I think about myself. And this stage is manana or reasoning. And then there is a further stage, which is nididhyasana, Vedantic meditation, where the problem is, our question is, that yes, now I know what Vedanta teaches me, I am Brahman. And now also through the process of reasoning, I am quite convinced that I get it now. I get it, I understand in what sense, what is the meaning of this teaching. It's clear to me now. And it's great. But I still have problems living it. You know, it doesn't still, I still feel like the same old guy and uh, I react. What's worse is I still react to life not as limitless consciousness, but just this guy, as I used to. Maybe a little better, or maybe a little worse. But <laughs> now that I'm Brahman, <laughs> uh, no. So uh, how do I make this a living uh, truth for me? And that is um, the third stage, is the techniques of meditation, where you immerse yourself in the clarity already gained. I'll repeat that. The Vedantic meditation is to immerse yourself in the clarity that you've already gained through the first two stages. Now this text, the one which we are going to go into today, which we are going to get a taste of today, um, is unique in the sense that it refers to the, that second stage of Vedantic, uh, the, the procedure. You know, it sort of assumes that we know what Vedanta is all about. So if uh, there are absolute newcomers here, uh, apologies to them. <laughs> One senior Swami would say, when you give a talk, there should be something for uh, everybody and, uh, oh, um, there should be something for everybody and everything for some people at least. <laughs> but today it might not be something for everybody because it already assumes familiarity with non-dual Vedanta. Then when we have this question, how am I Brahman? This is where the text comes in. What it wants to do is pretty radical. It wants to use our present experience, the experience of life as we have it right now, and to show us that you are Brahman, it's pretty clear. It's pretty easy. It's pretty obvious. We'll just make it clear to you. We will show you through argument and experience. What experience? Just the experience that we have already, that you are Brahman. It's, it's a pretty, uh, as we shall see, it's a big task. It's a difficult thing to do. Um, and therefore, what he will do is a set of arguments based on our experience, trying to convince you that you are Brahman right now, to m make it clear. And um, also, not just arguments, it's also based on experience. At the end of it, we will not actually say that, I, all right, now I understand how I am Brahman, but I yet have to experience it. That's how most people react. No, the author doesn't want us to do that. The author at the end of this, this session, or the text at least, <laughs> um, if we begin to get it, we, sh we should say both, I understand what is meant by I am Brahman, and also I experience it. Mm -hmm. That's what the author is claiming, that the experience is already available. Let me just dwell on this for a couple of minutes before going ahead. I mentioned this earlier, there are different paradigms of spiritual life. You know, all the great mystical traditions, spiritual traditions in the great religions of the world, they operate on different paradigms. Three main paradigms I'll bring before you today. They're yeah, central. One is the devotional paradigm. The devotional paradigm is there is God you know, in some form. Atheistic religions, all of them believe in God. There's God in some form, in some conception of God. And God exists. And our duty, our method of approaching God is Devotion, faith, love, surrender, worship, prayer, music, meditation, all of that. Um, the purpose being to connect ourselves to God, who is a real presence. To feel the presence of God 
and get the grace of God. By the grace of God, we shall be free from the travails of samsara, from our sorrow, and attain the happiness and fulfillment. It comes from there. Yeah. We just open ourselves to it and we want it and we remain tuned to the presence of God. All of this is called bhakti. Bhakti, devotion, love of God. And it's not uncommon. I mean, it's, it's, um, if you look at the, uh, the theistic religions in the world, they are all sort of so different models of bhakti. Just, you know, all of it. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Vaishnavism, Shaktaism, the devotional stuff that we do here, Sri Ramakrishna, all of it is bhakti. Then there's another um, approach in spiritual life. Uh, that is the yogic approach, the meditation approach, which you find in Patanjali Yoga, you find it in Buddhism, um, in Jainism, in Sankhya, uh, where the, um, the premise, the paradigm is not that there is a God and you have to believe in God and then have faith and by the grace of God you will be delivered or saved. No, the, the paradigm is that you are that ultimate truth, you are pure consciousness, you have to know yourself as you truly are and the way to know yourself as you truly are is meditation. Meditation. Because the problem here is not one of you know, lack of belief. In bhakti the problem is a lack of belief, lack of faith. And the solution is faith in God and surrender to God. But in uh, the yogic approach, the problem is restlessness of the mind. And the paradigm is that if you calm the mind down, if you sufficiently settle the mind and focus it in that stillness, in a pure and still mind, your inner, the, the, your reality, purusha, the pure consciousness, uh, that shines forth and becomes clear to you. And that is enlightenment. And that's also a, a particular paradigm. Uh, problem, restlessness of mind, solution is um, calming the mind down in meditation. And there are many traditions which take this approach. Uh, multiple forms of meditative practices. Now what we are going to do in this text today is neither of these. The author will not ask us to believe in something and then surrender and have faith and all. No, 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 not at all. The author also will not ask us to close our eyes and stop thinking. Don't stop thinking and don't close your eyes. And especially a hot, humid day, it's, 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 an, it's a hazard. You'll, you'll fall asleep immediately. A uh, uh, hot, humid day and uh, high philosophy make for a very bad combination. <laughs> a very soporific combination. So in, what the author expects, the Advaitic paradigm is um, insight. Not believing in something, not even doing meditation to get some kind of extraordinary mystical experience which we do not have at this time. No, no, no. As we shall see, as we shall go into this, uh, we'll see he's only appealing to our uh, experience which we have right now, already, effortlessly we have it. Perhaps we do not notice it or we do not understand its implications. So what the author will do in this text is draw our attention to some clear fact of our experience all the time. All of us have it. And then draw out the implications, and then we begin to see, hopefully. So this is a very radical approach. This is nowadays it's called the direct path. You know, that uh, um, instantaneous, effortless, where everybody is very happy. Oh, so I don't have to put in years and years of practice. Effortless, right now. And right now, not years and years, and not lots of hard practice, but uh, effortless and instantaneous. Yes, in some sense, true. If you get it, at that moment, it's effortless and instantaneous. If you don't get it, it could be years and years of hard practice. <laughs> yeah. We have to keep at it, no doubt. All right. With this background, I shall start. So what, what is call, we are called upon to do is listen carefully first. Huh? What is the text saying? What is the author saying to us? And then try to get it to the steps of the argument. It's going to be very closely argued. Um, a lot of packed uh, arguments here. I'll try to make it as simple as possible. But it is going to be intense. It's like a slightly prolonged TED talk. <laughs> so a lot of ideas put in a short time. Um, and the, so to get, first listen carefully, second try to get it, follow the steps of the argument and connect the whole argument, put it together. And third, it's not just about arguing and reasoning and trying to understand, but also seeing it as a fact. It's as much of an 
op- you know, Vivekananda called it an open secret. It's secret. That's why we need to hear it because we don't know it. Um, you know, it's not common sense. Um, but it's also open. So if it's right here, right now, what what we are talking about that I am Brahman, uh, I need to match it with my experience. So it's going to be very intense, and I think this talk will require a Q and A, a question answer. So today, after a long time, we'll follow up the talk with a Q and A, um, a short Q and A. We'll finish the talk, and then they'll, we'll give a ten-minute break. The people, those who want to leave, or just want to stretch your legs and come back, you can do. You're free to do that, and then we'll reassemble here for the Q and A. I still haven't started, and we've got fifteen minutes into the talk. All right, but I think this background was necessary. What the author wants to do, he has a particular strategy. The strategy is this. If two things fit the same definition, they are, they are, they are the same thing. If Brahman is Sat, Chit, Ananda, existence, consciousness, bliss, limitless being, limitless awareness, limitless fulfillment, joy, bliss, Sat, Chit, Ananda, that formulation, and if I, it can be shown that I am Satchidananda to my satisfaction, then I must be Brahman. This is a simple strategy. The task before the author is to convince us that you are limitless existence, limitless consciousness, and li- limitless joy or fulfillment. That's your real nature. And as through reason, you must give a check mark that yes, um, check, I understand. The arguments hold up. And not only that, more important, as a fact. So that's why I say, because it is both reasoning and experience, I think that it's not just a manana grantha, a text of reasoning, the second stage. It's also a text of meditation, because it's continuously pointing out what you are. All right. So the definition of Brahman, this is the strategy, the definition of Brahman which we find in the Vedanta text, that's why we need to be a little familiar with what what Vedanta teaches us. The broad definitions of Brahman which are very famous actually and found in the Vedanta text, the original Vedanta text, the Upanishads, and then trying to match it with ourselves. This is the strategy. All right. The first well-known Definition, formulation of Brahman always is, you know, Satchidananda, existence, consciousness, bliss. Though you don't find exactly that formulation in the Upanishads, you will find famously in the Taittiriya Upanishad, Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma, infinite existence, consciousness is Brahman. And then there's another um, separate definition, Anandam Brahma uh, Vyajanat, no Ananda, bliss to be Brahman. You can put them together. Um, so, Satchit Ananda, limitless. It's not that Brahman is something that exists. It is existence itself, as Vivekananda said. It's not that Brahman is something that knows. Uh, it is knowledge itself or consciousness itself. It's not that Brahman is something that's very happy. Uh, it's happiness itself or bliss itself. So Satchit Ananda, that formulation. And the whole purpose being that once we realize ourselves as that, once we see as a fact, we'll also see immediately simultaneously, that we are actually beyond suffering. We are beyond death. Body will die, but if I am Satchidananda and I can clearly see that, then I will not die. It will be also obvious to me. Should be. Uh, It is the mind which goes through ups and downs, through depression, anxiety, fear, desire, frustration. But if I am not the mind, I am Satchidananda, I have no, uh, no fear at all, no anxiety at all, no depression at all. It should be become clear to me. So this is the strategy. It's a powerful strategy, but it's a big claim. Let's see how well it holds up under examination. Um, All right. With this background, let's dive into the first verse. The first verse is most important, where he reveals his whole strategy, the author. The first verse goes like this. Aham asmi sadabhami na kadachin naham apriyaha Brahme vaham mato siddham satchidananda lakshanam. Simple Sanskrit. He's a poet, so sometimes uh, his uh, Sanskrit is also very beautiful, simple but very beautiful. He says in this uh, verse, in this shloka, in this verse, he says, I am. Oh, must be. I am. Bhami, I shine. When? Sada, all the time. 
and at no time i am the uh, i am not beloved to myself i'll explain all of it therefore i am brahman that's established which is existence consciousness bliss which is defined in the books as existence consciousness bliss now what does this mean there is a lot to unpack here first i am in all our experience of life whatever experience we have in life there is a background factor a constant factor which we overlook all the time and the author wants to bring our attention to that factor right now in our experience whatever you know you're sitting here listening i'm sa- standing here talking in all these experiences there is the background experience of my own existence that i am this i amness is present all our lives throughout our lives in every experience that that we have you see when i'm uh, looking at this flower it's not that you know an accurate description of this flower would be that it's not just a flower it's a flower in my experience isn't that a more truth, truthful accurate real way of putting it it's not just a flower a more complete way of describing it is i am seeing the flower and notice when you shift your attention and look at the podium uh-huh. flower is different podium is different now you will say the um, an accurate way of describing this would be i am looking at the podium i am remains constant the flower and the podium are different you might say looking also remains constant but then if i say i am listening to what you are saying swami uh-huh. so your words i am listening looking changed into listening um, the flower changed into the podium changed into your words but i am remain constant whatever you see i am seeing is true the i am is there conversely conversely very interesting a simple fact but dramatic fact when you're looking at me you're seeing me right now i am seeing you swami and close your eyes clearly you are not seeing me now i am not seeing you but i am is still there right open your eyes now so i am uh yeah i have to be careful about that <laughs> some will go deep into samadhi and then <laughs> when i'm seeing you i'm there when i close my eyes i do not see you i'm still there then nobody doubts this when i am hearing you i am there if i plug my ears and i don't hear anything at all i'm still there but reverse this just as a thought experiment think suppose i am was not there this i am feeling this i amness it was not there would there would seeing still happen no would hearing still happen no thinking no that i am is crucial follow this some of you are with me or some of you are puzzled this is a, um, a thought experiment i am seeing now i am not seeing but i am still there this i am suppose it was not there There's no i am suppose what would be there nothing as far as i am concerned nothing just just blankness complete zero this i am is constant in all experiences the objects of experience come and go whatever i see whatever i see i am there whatever i hear smell taste touch i am is constant and it's the same i am the objects are different the senses are different seeing is different from hearing is different from smelling is different from touching but i am is con- constant and it's the same i am and then let's go to our inner experiences of thinking see senses are external we are, we are contacting an external world we see hear smell taste touch but internally we all have a private life we think we remember when we think different thoughts so many thoughts come to our mind but each thought is shining in the light of i am we ignore the i am we are absorbed in what we are seeing what we are thinking what we are feeling but i am is constant so the author brings our attention to the i am which is our constant experience aham asmi when i am yeah i am that's true but what's the what's the big deal about it not only i am sada asmi all the time in all our experiences the i am is there in fact without the i am we cannot conceive of any experience 
Experience is not possible without the I am for me. So I am is constant. In our inner lives also, whatever thought comes and goes, the I am is there. Whatever um, emotion comes and goes, when I'm feeling great, I am feeling great. I am. When I'm feeling down in the dumps, I am feeling down in the dumps. It's the same I am which was feeling great, it's the same I am which is feeling down in the dumps. Depressed. That means by nature, the I am must be free of feeling great or feeling depressed. Those things come and go. But the I am is constant in all the emotions. Throughout my waking life, I am. And when I fall asleep and dream, I am. In the dream too, I am. When I wake up, I will dismiss the dream. That it was all a dream. But I could not deny that I experienced it. I dreamt it. So I am was there in the dream. Even in deep sleep, Advaita Vedanta, we have talked about this many times. Advaita Vedanta would say deep sleep is not an absence of experience. It's an experience of absence. It is the I am revealing a blankness, an absence of objects to be experienced. In waking, dreaming, deep sleep, I am. All the time. Aham asmi, sadha asmi, all the time. And it cannot be denied. It's the one thing that we cannot deny in our experience. It goes back to 400, 300 years or so, Descartes. You know, we all read the Cartesian coordinates in mathematics and all. The French mathematician and philosopher. And his project, famous project of doubting whatever could be doubted. Whatever could be doubted, he doubted. Suppose this world, how do I know it exists? I could be dreaming. And he was so far ahead of his time, virtual reality. He said, suppose there's an evil demon. We can project reality to my senses. Just like virtual reality. Hmm. So, what meta and virtual reality glasses and oculus, all those things are there. Suppose there's something like that is happening. Long before the Matrix movie, Descartes says, suppose there's an evil demon which projects my world. How will I know this is a real world or just projected? And so I can doubt whatever, even what I see, hear, smell, taste, touch, which seems to be real to me, I can doubt it. In dreams also that happens. In virtual reality today that happens. Um, but the one thing he found he could not doubt was his own existence. You cannot doubt the doubter. If the doubt is there, then there's a doubter. If the thought is there, then there's a thinker. I exist because I think. I think, therefore I exist. The cogitor gusum. He could not deny his own existence. So he had found the rock bottom, the solid basis on which to build up knowledge. So his project, his project of skepticism, for that he found a ground for knowledge. That is, in the existence of this I am. Undeniable. Eight, 800, nearly a thousand years before Descartes, Shankaracharya writes, Yaeva tasya nirakarta tasyaeva atmasa Whoever denies the existence of the self is the self itself. It is its, it's his own self. <laughs> so if you deny your own existence, you are that one, you are, you are proved it by the very act of denying that you exist. Yeah. Same thing. You cannot deny this I am. Sada asmi. And this I am is constant. See, we have this kind of feeling that, um, yes, but, you know, I feel that this world exists and it's really existing. It's, it's changing all the time. I am unchanging. But this world was there before I am came into being. And this world will continue and I am will die one day. <laughs> we think like that. It's very strange. I find myself, I am to be unchanging in all my experiences. Yet I have this intuition that I'm going to die one day. Because everybody else is dying, so I'll die. This question of death, very interesting. We don't have an experience of death. None of us. So aren't you a Hindu Swami? You must have died thousands of times earlier. Yes, but the body died. If, you're, if as a Hindu, it's a fact that I have, uh, I believe in rebirth. In that case, I believe that there is no death. Because it's the body died, and if I'm still there, then I have not died. Nobody has an experience of death that is a complete cessation. In fact, it's logically impossible. You cannot ex uh, experience your complete extinction. If you are extinguished, then what is experiencing anything at all? You cannot logically experience your own death. 
Why do we feel that this I am will die one day? We'll come to that little later. But it's not just I am. Notice this I am is shining. Aham asmi sada bhami. I not only exist all the time, I am all the time, but I also shine. Shine not in the sense of light. It's not that you're radioactive or something. It means that you are of the nature of consciousness, awareness. Just as nothing in this room would be visible until we switched on the light. And the light reveals everything in this room which is non-luminous. It is revealed by light. And the light reveals itself. You don't need to switch on this other light to see that light. No. So the light has a unique nature of illumining everything and, il and revealing itself also. But more than that, it's not, the light does, is not really self-luminous. It's you to you, the consciousness, the light is revealed. So you are the light of lights. Every evening we sing here to Sri Ramakrishna, Jyoti Ra Jyoti. Light of lights. Ujala Ridikandara. Shining in our hearts. What is the light of lights shining in our hearts? It's nothing other than consciousness, awareness. So this I am is not only an existing thing, like a table or a chair is an existing thing. No, not like that. It's also a shining reality. You exist all the time, you are all the time, and you shine all the time, ceaselessly. All of our waking life is revealed to you, the consciousness, the I am awareness. All of our dreams are revealed, your dreams, you're revealed to you, the consciousness, the I am awareness. And even the darkness of deep sleep is revealed to you. I am the awareness. You are not extinguished in deep sleep. You know, Descartes should have gone one step further. Huh? That it's not that I think, therefore I am. Vedanta would say, I am, therefore I think. When I do not think, suppose I don't think, have I disappeared? But the same logic, you know, when I look at you, I am there. If I don't look at you, have I disappeared? For me, you have disappeared, but I have I disappeared to myself? No. In that case, if I don't see, hear, smell, taste, touch, I am is still there. If I don't think, remember, feel, desire, I am is still there. Just not expressing itself in any, any particular way. The Upanishad says, so he's always drawing upon the Upanishads. Upanishad says, uh, it says uh, in the Katha Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, beautiful mantras, Tameva bhantam manubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. That shining, everything else shines here. By its light, everything here is, uh, is revealed. You shining, uh, everything uh, shines. Shines means is revealed. You know, it's known. Uh, like the light shining, every, all the chairs and tables and things in the people in this room are known. By your light, everything here is revealed. You shining, the mind shines with you know, thoughts, feelings, emotions become uh, apparent, apparent to you. And the mind shining, then the senses shine. It's only when the mind is awake, you are able to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. And the senses shining, the world is revealed to you. So you, you, by your light, everything else is revealed. That is called Bhami, Sada Bhami, all the time I am shining. I am all the time, all the time I am shining. Then one more thing he points out, the, the author. Kadachit naham apriyaha. Here is drawing upon, to my best knowledge, upon the masterpiece, uh, Vedantic masterpiece, the Panchadashi. In the first chapter of the Panchadashi, the great master Vidyaranya, Vidyaranya Swami, he wants to show us that this I am, this isness consciousness. By the way, sometimes I use the term isness. So I used to think that I came up with it and I found in the inspired talks of Swami Vivekananda he says this isness which is everywhere <laughs> and within course he says exactly the same isness. Um, in the, uh, there in the Panchadashi by argument he wants to show that we are of the nature of bliss. So the argument he gives a twofold argument which is encapsulated here by the author Lakshmi Dhara. The twofold argument to show what you our bliss itself, our ananda itself, our joy itself. How does he want to prove that to us, or point it out to us? He says, um, this is Vidyarnya, I'm quoting from there. Um, Whatever gives us happiness, pleasure, joy in this world, we like that. 
so the kinds of food which which we uh, which give us pleasure we like those kinds of food the people who make us happy we like those people so and whatever we like we want to keep we want to so we want to hang around with the people who make us happy we like them we want to eat the foods which give us pleasure we like it we like those the foods we want to go to the places we want to do the job uh, we want to do those spiritual practices and so on and so forth all of which which give us happiness and that which does not give us happiness we want to get rid of we want to avoid yeah. that that kind of you know it could be the same thing the gadget which uh, i really liked which i thought will give me a lot of happiness and i queued up in black friday to buy it and i got it at a lot of effort few years later what junk i have to get rid of it what happened the gadget might think if it could think that what what happened to you you got me from the shop with so much uh, trouble and now you want to throw me out on the street why because you, uh, oh gadget you gave me a lot of happiness at that time but you don't give me happiness now so that which gives me happiness i want it i want to buy it i want to keep it i want to increase it that which does not give me happiness i want to get rid of it i want to avoid it all right so this is understood now the argument is there is one thing which we always want we want its company we want to keep it we want to keep it all the time and we never ever want to get rid of it what's that ourselves ourselves we ourselves we want the the, the tremendous urge to live in this body Yes, the Vedanta will say that you identify yourself entirely with this body. That's why you want to keep this body going. But basically, what you want to keep going is yourself. And you know, science fiction is full of stories of how one day you'll be able to upload yourself into the cloud or something. Then all right, then the, then we'll be very happy. Let the body die. I, I can I as long as I continue. You know, all Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and we you know we believe in rebirth. We believe that at one point the body dies and we lose contact with this body. We are very happy. Let them burn it, bury it, whatever, because I know I continue without that body. So my continuity, I always want. I never want to finish off myself. And I can know what you are all thinking. What about suicide? What about all those people who want to kill themselves? Um, in fact, I have a. a um, uh, a movie sh- not a documentary shoot coming up for the national mental health week where i'm supposed to speak out against suicide so what about suicide people who uh, want to die then notice in the case of suicide it's not really that they want to get rid of themselves they want to get rid of associated problems mm-hmm. somebody has a terrible debt and uh, she is no way of paying up the debt and wants to kill uh, himself or herself they say that when the great depression hit 1929 the people who jumped off from the what building was that empire state building at that time the world trade center no no empire state 1929 brought yeah the financial center people some people just jumped off they saw they have lost everything with beyond any hope of recovery of anything they just went up the window and jumped uh i i saw this cartoon of a psychiatrist he's sitting in a t- typical thing and i think must be in manhattan then he's sitting there and the patient is lying on the couch and and the, the psychiatrist is saying there there you shouldn't be so sad tell me why do you want to kill yourself that's one panel and the next panel the psychiatrist is standing on the ledge of the window about to jump because he says you have convinced me <laughs> i should also kill myself no if that person was a terrible debt who has a terrible disease who has a, a lot of chronic pain and wants to die if you cure that pain if you pay off those debts and then you should tell the guy the so how do you feel now great what about your plans for suicide oh no 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 i don't want to kill myself so it's only under certain problems that we uh, but by our by ourselves we don't want to wipe out ourselves so the self is never an object of displeasure now we like things we want to keep things which give us happiness so if we want if we like ourselves and we want to keep ourselves alive all the time then it stands to reason we are always a source of happiness for ourselves i'll repeat that we always keep we want to keep things which are a source of happiness if it gives us happiness i'll keep it the moment it stops giving me happiness i want to get rid of it or avoid it huh? 
Now, if I always want to keep myself alive, I always want my own company. That means I am a source of happiness to myself, even if we don't agree. It's a strange way of thinking, but it must be so. Not only am I always a source of happiness, keep these ideas in mind. You have to you know, ponder or let them sink in. These are new and strange ways of thinking, unaccustomed ways of thinking. Then there is an associated argument. Not only am I always a source of happiness for myself, but it's not a trickle of happiness. I'm also the source of maximum happiness for myself. This is the second argument which Vidyaranya gives and which the author here is pointing towards is, the second argument, argument goes like this. If something is loved for the sake of something else, that something else is loved more than the first one. And remember, we always love things which give us happiness. Now, if something is loved, A is loved for the sake of B, you actually love B more than A. What does it mean? So, a classic example of a um, mother who loves the toys um, her kids play with. Now, if you ask, does she love the toys more or the kids more? No, you, you laugh. What a, what a question. Of course, she loves the kids more. She loves the toys because of the kids. Uh, for the sake of the kids, because my son or daughter loves this toy, therefore it's also a, an object that is something dear to me. Uh -huh. And it will continue to be dear to me. When the son and daughter grows up and uh, is not concerned with the toys anymore, the mother will still love the toy because of the memories associated with the son or daughter. Uh -huh. So, whatever is loved for the sake of something else, that other thing is loved more. If you love something more, it means it's giving you more happiness. Now, if there is something for which everything else is loved, everything in the universe is loved for that one thing, that one thing must be loved most of all. And that what you love most of all is something that must be giving you maximum happiness. And what do we love most of all? <laughs> I always give this example. <laughs> that sounds awful, but uh, it's true in a, in a very deep philosophical sense. It's not awful, it's beautiful actually. Um, this person said, oh, I really love my job. And the example is this. I really love my job. It's a very nice job. And pays well. But yeah, it's not for the money. I love doing the job. All right. Then do the job. We won't pay you anymore. <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to pay me. Choose um, the job or the money. Suppose I were giving you an, uh, an, uh, an option. You don't have to do the job. We'll just give you the money. You earn $100,000 or something like that, and we'll just give you the money, you don't have to do anything. Or, you do the job, but we won't give you anything. So I think most people would say, I want the money. All right, you get, so the money is loved more than the job. And if you get the money, suppose uh, someone says, you can get the money, but you can't spend it. Ever. You can't invest it, spend it, nothing. And they say, no, 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 I want to spend it. I want to use that money uh, to buy things. All right, you can buy those things. I want to buy things for my family, for my friends, and so on. All right, you can buy those things for your family and friends and so on, but they won't be your family or friends. They'll be just some random people. <laughs> no, no, they have to be my family and friends. You see, it comes back to me. The job is loved for the sake of the money. The money is loved for the sake of the things it buys. The, sake of the things which it buys is loved for the sake of the people you buy it for. They must be your people. It comes back to me. Yeah. And if you will X for the sake of Y, then Y is loved more. Y for the sake, uh, sake of Z, then Z is loved more. Um, money is loved more than the job. The things it buys is loved more than the money. The people you buy it for are loved more than the things. And the people are related to the self. That's why you love them. So the self is loved more than the people. The self is the locus of maximum happiness and continuous happiness. So continuous happiness, maximum happiness, Atma, the self. Okay, so put them together. What do we have now? I am continuous existence. I am. I am continuous awareness. Shining. I am continuous source of happiness for myself, continuous source of joy. This is what is called Sat Chit Ananda. Things of the world come and go, they are not Sat. Uh -huh. um, experiences, various kinds of conscious experiences come and go, they are not Chit. Um, 
the various pleasures in the world and pains in the world come and go they are not ananda the continuous existence consciousness bliss that is called satchidananda then the author says triumphantly brahmaivaham atah siddham siddham hence proved qed we say hence proved i am brahman how look at your books open the books now satchidananda lakshanam it has been defined what was our strategy we will find the definition of brahman then we we'll look at it in our lives we'll put them together and see there is same thing then i must honestly say now aham brahmasmi i am brahman all right let that sink in now we'll go ahead a little further one more verse we'll take up and then i'll stop 28 verses they're all like this every possible question and doubt you could have and you know, you struggle against the fact no 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 i am not brahman and tell me why and i'll show you you are brahman without any possible doubt see the two, two things you have to keep together one is the arguments which we just just did they're yeah, pretty simple but strange i mean we don't think in those ways uh also more importantly the experiences these uh, statements are pointing towards the experience of i amness the i amness is however it's not ego if you stress the i it becomes the ego but the ego is not constant in dream in deep sleep the ego disappears you don't nobody ever says i am sleeping now then you are not sleeping <laughs> sometimes mothers will see if the kids are tucked in are they sleeping or not Uh, and uh, so and so is a good little boy if he is really truly asleep his um, right big toe will move and the boy moves his toe so you know <laughs> he's not really asleep <laughs> i am nobody says i am asleep ego dis- disappears and yet you are not gone i remember you know discussing this with a professor of the philosophy of mind at harvard university we were studying descartes and i said So Descartes I think therefore I exist and she said yes So when I do not think I don't exist So in deep sleep I don't think so Descartes popped out of existence every time he fell asleep and he popped into existence every time he woke up I never thought of that <laughs> Yes even when I'm not thinking I'm still there I am is there but the I is not stressed the amness is stressed So um I am I shine I am always the object of greatest love or uh, f- f- for myself so satchidananda now a question arises wait a minute you're saying i am brahman but there is another definition of brahman quite apart from satchidananda in all the upanishads brahman is the source of the universe the universe was created um, by brahman in brahman it is the ground of the entire universe existence con- uh, the srishti sthiti pralaya the projection existence and dissolution of the universe the ground of that uh, in sanskrit asya jagata janma sthiti bhanga yasma tad brahma of this universe where from its origination in which it exists into which it finally dissolves that is brahman are you the source of the universe you may think so but i don't think so <laughs> you don't look like it <laughs> you don't look like you could do it <laughs> does are you in new york or is new york in you that in which the universe exists is new york in you or are you in new york we are in new york how can how can new york be in me and let alone the entire universe so the second definition another definition of brahman is the brahman is you know all the definitions of god in theistic religions god is the creator of the universe so brahman is also the creator preserver and destroyer of the universe um in that case how are you brahman so now the next big question you have to prove sarvagyam sarvakaranam the the cause the creator of the entire universe not only that omniscient brahman is omniscient i clearly am not i didn't create the universe don't don't ask me i am not responsible <laughs> who created the universe not me and yet vedanta insists you are the cause of this entire universe you are omniscient and also and so forth how do you prove that and the uh, author is equal to the task in the next verse he is going to prove that you are the source of the entire universe and you are the cause of this ent- you of this entire universe and you are omniscient also to boot and he'll do that let's see i'm going to present a series of tightly interlocked arguments now first the second verse and then 
मय्ये वेति चिद्योमनी जगद्गंधर्वपत्तनम अतोहम कथम न ब्रह्म अतोहम कथम न ब्रह्म सर्वज्ञ सर्वकारण इन मी द स्काय ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस चिद्व्योम चिद आकाश आकाश मीन्स स्काय व्योम मीन्स स्काय इन मी द स्काय ऑफ कॉन्शियसनेस द द यूनिवर्स एराइजेस लाइक कैसल्स इन द स्काय लिटरल ट्रांसलेशन इज लाइक द सिटी ऑफ द गंधर्वस which is what we, in english we have a phrase castles in the sky you know you ima- imagine things in the uh, in the clouds cities people whatever when you go in the plains it's like some some persons are talking or something fantastic shapes in the clouds so castles in the clouds uh, castles in the sky the universe arises in me in me which me not this person what we just discussed now i am constant i am constant i the shining constant i who is never uh, an object of displeasure on of lack of love for myself so this existence consciousness bliss in that the universe arises uh, as um you know as a mirage uh, as an uh, as a dream uh, as uh, you know, like a movie on a screen like uh, a castles in the sky a city of gandharvas in the sky देरफोर ही इज कम्बैटिव हियर अतो अतो हम कथम न ब्रह्म सो हाउ एम आई नॉट ब्रह्म यू आर द कॉज ऑफ दिस यूनिवर्स एंड यू आर ओमनेशियन सो लेट्स जस्ट लुक इन टू दिस क्विकली एंड आई स्टॉप सेट ऑफ आर्ग्यूमेंट्स फॉलो केयरफुली द फर्स्ट वी स्टार्ट वेर वी लेफ्ट ऑफ आई एम इज कॉन्स्टेंट in all our experiences in all our experiences i am is constant but what we experience continually changes the people in our lives come and go and the places we go to we are different places we we see time changes all the time from from uh, childhood to middle age to uh, old age time is flowing body is changing mind is continuously changing thoughts are changing ideas are changing memories are arising and disappearing and being forgotten also mm. all of this is changing and i am the constant i am this always shining not changing in all experiences now if things here is the argument things which come into existence and disappear we say technically they don't have intrinsic existence they have borrowed existence what's the argument here this is being borrowed from the bhagavad gita second chapter a profound verse 16th verse nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate satah the unreal never has any existence the real never goes out of existence what does that mean um consider this example hot potato hot potato <laughs> not metaphorically a real hot potato so uh, the, the the potato by itself intrinsically it's not hot it's only when you have only when you have boiled it it's hot so it's borrowed its heat from the boiling water what's the proof of that because it was not hot it's hot now and the heat will disappear once you serve it and put it on the plate on the table after some time it will cool down it's no longer a hot potato <laughs> so the heat is lost if the heat comes and goes it shows that it's not intrinsic to that object it's not a property of that object it was borrowed from something else and we say obviously yes the boiling water but the boiling water doesn't have heat of its own yeah. it's borrowed it from the, from the hot saucepan uh, under it the hot saucepan also is not hot all the time it's only when you know the electric heater or the fire which is burning underneath that the saucepan borrows the heat from there and lends some of it to the water and the water lends some of it to the potato and our job is done we have cooked the potato or boiled it but the fire is interesting the fire has not borrowed heat from anywhere else the fire is intrinsically hot as long as the fire is there and burning it's going to be hot sort of common sense example so it's intrinsically hot the fire does not gain heat or lose heat as long as it's there it's hot every object that borrows heat from the fire gains the heat and loses it it and the characteristic of uh, be- borrowing something is that you gain it and lose it it should be obvious we are in manhattan a debt society you know de- debt fueled by debt people borrow all the time 
there's a f phrase where maxed out your cards <laughs> maxed out your <laughs> what <laughs> that means you went on a shopping spree and you bought well, well uh, beyond your means and that's encouraged that's what keeps the uh, economy going but then people can come and repossess your homes your cars and well, what happened and the creditors came and took it away you gained it and you had uh, you know very high flying manhattan lifestyle and then suddenly you lost it again what happened you didn't actually own it it wasn't yours it was on borrowed you know credit on borrowed money but if you are oh this is a nice example i was walking in the park and there was this guide showing people around and um, near the lake he showed people so he was talking to tourists this is called the west side upper west and this is called new money and this is people that this they are the celebrities and tech people and all very rich people and famous people and this he uh, gives a list of rattles of a list of people living in san remo and uh, um, uh, what is that el dorado t towers and so on and on the other side is east side that's called old money so they have had it for generations and then he said where i come from i'm from the bronx that's no money <laughs> So the sign of old money is that it doesn't come and go so easily. It it belongs to you for a, for a long time. So similarly, and a characteristic which is intrinsically yours will not come come and go. Now, so heat coming and going. Fire has intrinsic heat. The potato or the water or the saucepan does not have intrinsic heat. It came and went. But fire's heat does not come and go. Now, here's the philosophical question: If something has existence itself as an intrinsic property. It, then what will happen to it if something has borrowed existence what will happen to it if you borrow something what happens it comes and goes if you borrow existence it will come and go if uh, and borrowed existence uh, uh, coming and going another way of saying it is birth and death creation and destruction if something comes into being and goes out of being born and died created and destroyed came into existence and disappeared from existence it borrowed existence But if something does not have borrowed existence, what will happen to it? It will be exist. Yeah, it will always be there. It will be still G great. That's a good way of putting it. It will be always there. It will never come into existence. It will never go out of existence because it's old money, old existence. It existence belongs to it. Now apply it to that I am. I am seeing flowers, hearing sound, meeting people. Uh, I'm young, and then I uh, I was young. Now I am old. All of these flowers and sounds and people and places and jobs and uh, and uh, uh, young and old. All of them came and went. That means they don't have intrinsic existence. But I am. I shine. Sat chit anand. That my that that real nature. never comes and goes it's always there so i am has intrinsic existence and whatever this i am experiences in life none of it has intrinsic existence it comes and goes therefore it must have borrowed existence where will something borrow existence from where will the potato borrow its heat from you say oh, from the boiling water not really they have all borrowed their heat from fire they may lend to each other but they have borrowed it from fire all this universe what the author is driving at is all this universe of experience whatever you experience in this life everything has borrowed existence from you the i am not you the body even the body has borrowed its experience from you the i am not even you the person and that person comes and goes in deep sleep the person disappears but the i am continues the isness awareness continues just a little footnote when i keeps talking about existence as intrinsic property those who are philosophically trained if you're not philosophically trained you are safe but if you're philosophically trained then you will immediately notice that existence cannot be a property bertrand russell's theory of descriptions uh, proves that very clearly you know if, um, and what he pointed out was um, when you say something has a property the table is brown what it means is there exists an entity called the table which has the property of being brown therefore you cannot say existence is a property otherwise how would you express it there exists an entity called a table which has the property of existence that sounds strange <laughs> it sounds even more strange when you say something 
does not have the property of existence something died or is destroyed then how would you say the table is destroyed how would you say you would say and button russell's theory of descriptions there exists an entity called the table which doesn't exist <laughs> how strange so existence cannot be a property that's right but we'll just set it aside many of you look puzzled don't worry about it <laughs> it's just um a little extra thinking lands you in trouble so yeah existence is not a property but we are thinking um, that can be dealt with later so the one thing which does not have borrowed existence i am and everything else has borrowed existence in that case they must have all borrowed their existence from you from the i am everything and everybody and every incident and every time and every place you have experienced has borrowed its existence from the i am it appears as an other but it depends on you for their existence a good example is a dream in a dream you see people you have experiences you have your own personality in the dream also and you meet people you go to places but when you wake up you know for sure whatever you saw whomever you saw whatever you did including you yourself the person in the dream all of it borrowed its existence from the dreaming mind from you the dreamer isn't it uh -huh. the you the dreamer was like the i am in the present case uh -huh. so now this is called cause and effect uh -huh. effect the the table is an effect the the altar is an effect what is the cause the wood it was wood earlier now it has been given the form of a table that's been given the form of the altar and one day this will be destroyed uh, it will still be wood before it was a table before it was an altar it was wood and when it is a table what is it touch touch wood be confident <laughs> touch wood touch the altar is still touch wood so when it is an effect an altar a product table product altar all sorts of products you go there to ikea as long as you <laughs> find wooden uh, products you know they're all wood so when all the products all the effects in all the effects the cause continues in all wooden furniture wood continues in all waves water continues in all golden ornament gold continues <laughs> gold is the cause of material cause of all the our golden ornaments water is the material out of which all waves and foam and surf comes and uh, wood is the material out of which all wooden furniture comes i am is the material out of which the universe of experience comes i am is the cause the material cause and this universe it is what becomes or you know this entire universe now the opponent might say ah got you the cause is transformed into the effect it is the seed which becomes the tree the seed is gone now it's a tree it is the milk which becomes the yogurt now the milk is gone it's yogurt now if the cause is transformed into the effect then you the i am the satchidananda brahman has been transformed into this world it's a world now it is people places good and bad you know sky and earth so you're gone the i am is finished brahman is finished it's just a world that's been transformed into the world i say aha that's where the castles in the sky the city of gandharvas comes in I said no but there's another kind of causality in uh, vedanta we talk about two kinds parinama transformation vivarta appearance the um, seed is transformed into the tree milk is transformed into yogurt true but the rope is not transformed into the snake the rope appears as the snake the movie screen is does not become a, uh, the people and the places and things it doesn't become a hero uh, and a villain and chasing the hero and then and the, it doesn't become a car and a gun and a gun fight no it doesn't it appears like a movie yeah. in the dream you the dreamer you don't actually become the places and go to the places and actually do those things which happened in the dream that's why it's called a dream it appeared in your mind so that's another kind of causality where the cause appears as the effect without transformation in vedant there is one word for all of this it's called vivarta uh, cause appearing as an effect but without undergoing any change at all the dry desert appears as the watery oasis mirage not a drop of water there it looks like that 
the sand doesn't didn't suddenly become water it just looks like that similarly the claim here is consciousness i amness it doesn't change so it can't transform into anything else but it can appear as its own universe just like you yourself sleeping happily in your bed appear as a dream universe without actually transforming similarly you appear as this universe of experience what you appear as is not real but you are real that old story of king janaka has become pretty popular i it was this was about 2004 I was in the Himalayas, staying in a little hut, meditating, studying, begging for my food, uh, and and I used to go with for walks in the before sunset, and in the very spectacular mountains, glaciers, and all of that. It was summer, so there was no snow there. It was comfortable. And once while while walking, there was monks would tell stories. So this monk told me a story about the Emperor Janaka. So the Emperor Janaka, he went to bed one day. and suddenly he was woken up by a, a sentry um your majesty wake up wake up we have what happened what's the emergency we have been attacked by the enemy oh we have to attacked by the enemy then call the general call out the army get my armor and my bow and arrows and sword we must go out and fight the enemy so he goes out and fights the enemy but the po- poor janaka is defeated by the enemy and then he's captured and he's dragged before the enemy the the conquering enemy king and the conqueror says Janaka you are of royal descent you are of royal blood so i will not kill you but you are exiled from your kingdom you have to get out from here before um, sunrise so poor janaka what can he do he struggles and walks and walks and walks now he's helpless and somehow he, i mean wherever he goes for drink of water or something nobody wants to help him because the new king is cruel and so somehow he manages to cross the border of his em- empire if he does that before sunrise it couldn't have been a very big empire anyway <laughs> so he now he's in the next kingdom and uh, he is desperate and tired and wounded and exhausted and and uh, you know broken inside and then he sees somebody pe- pe- giving food to the poor like a soup kitchen and he stands there in india it's a khichdi kitchen there's a khichdi that's the uh, rice and dal and all yeah. Now, when it comes for his turn, he has, uh, there's a bowl, uh, and uh, he comes to the place where the, it's being served, and at that moment, the person says, "It's gone. It's finished. Um, there's nothing left." And Janaka says, "Give me anything. For uh, I am terribly exhausted. I am." So they pick out a little bit of gruel at the bottom of the cauldron, and they serve that to him. And poor Janaka is going to drink that up. when when a kite swoops down from the sky and knocks the bowl from his hand it goes rolling and janaka falls helplessly on the ground he can't take it anymore and i heard it in hindi he said ha ha kar karte hue crying out alas alas the sanskrit ha ha is the exact opposite of the english ha ha <laughs> english ha ha is funny <laughs> so sanskrit ha ha means alas alas and he falls down and he wake, wakes up sits up in his bed at that point we would have gone oh what a nightmare what did i eat last night <laughs> but janaka is a philosopher is a philosopher emperor so he thinks was that true or is this true yeah. in hindi was such ya ye sach was that true or is this true and uh, the uh, guard comes running and says you shouted uh, is anything, anything wrong was that true or is this true the guard is scared and he goes and calls the queen the queen says now what is it old man <laughs> and he says was that true or is this true and she gets scared she calls the royal doctor the doctor examines him where does it hurt emperor are you are you feeling unwell was that true or is this true and he goes to court the next day and he's sitting there and courtiers are coming and you know business of the empire is being transacted but he just says the emperor just says one thing was that true or is this true it could be a dream the chinese philosopher chuang tzu he said he was he went to sleep under a tree and he was dreaming that he was a butterfly when he woke up he said but was i a philosopher dreaming that i was a butterfly or am i a butterfly dreaming that i am a philosopher <laughs> when the philosopher would ask such questions <laughs> now the great sage ashtavakra was visiting the city and he uh, heard the gossip 
like the grapevine like there was no social media in those days but it was like but it was all over the city that this emperor has lost his marbles he thinks he just keeps saying was that true or is this true and uh, then ashtavakra goes to the court and he asks uh, janaka how are you your majesty and he says um, the emperor says was that true or is this true nashtavakra who knows everything what's in the mind of the, of the emperor he says uh, um at that time when you were rolling in the dust and crying alas uh, was all this there the the army your glory your power your kingdom or was it all lost so all lost nothing was there none of this was there and right now when you are sitting in the midst of our glory and power that defeat that humiliation that exhaustion that pain is it there now he says no it's not there then ashtavakra says oh emperor neither that is true nor this is true and the emperor says good lord is nothing true then when the uh, sage says that at that time did you experience it or not he said yes you were there in some way you experienced it and here you are experiencing it right yes in that case oh emperor neither that is true nor this is true but you are the truth you are the truth that i amness that i am i shine huh? i am existence consciousness bliss that is the truth so you are the cause of this entire universe remember the links of the argument intrinsic existence borrowed existence causality cause is always uh, the effect borrows its existence from the cause cause is always there in the effect and there and this is a kind of causality which is vivart tra no transformation appearing like a city of gandharvas or castles in the sky this entire universe is a dream like appearance in you the i am the ever shining i am very quickly how does that make me all knowing i'll just touch upon that and finish sarvagyam all the things in this universe whatever we experience they know neither themselves nor anything else the table doesn't know itself and the table doesn't know the altar but i the consciousness i know the table and i know the altar i see it i can touch it you know and so and so forth so the objects in the universe objects of consciousness whatever you experience in the universe they are not aware of each other yeah. and not only they are, and they are not aware of themselves also you might say swami hold on i am aware of all of these people and all of these people and all animals and all they are all aware of each other but bodies are not aware of each other it's the consciousness which is reflected in and through the mind so this whole vedantic epistemology is there that's what makes you aware of yourself and everything else it is consciousness alone which is the knower in every episode of knowing vedantic epistemology is consciousness makes possible knowledge and your own experience look at it just what did what did we do at the very beginning we did that i am and i am aware of you i'm i can see you i close my eyes i can't see you but i still am but if i leave that i am out if push that out then all knowledge disappears right so consciousness is that which knows through a mechanism through instruments same consciousness through the mind through the eyes sees the object and says i see i am and i see through the ears uh, uh, the um, mind and the ear same consciousness i hear through the mind i think but if mind ears eyes all were taken away i am would still be there but it would not see or hear or smell or taste or think but if you took the i am away no knowledge would be possible at all that's why you know all this ai talk of ai there is no real knowledge there there's no first person experience of knowing because consciousness is the only thing that has not been simulated there everything else is there intelligence um, memory creativity all of that so all knowledge is knowledge by consciousness whatever is known wherever it is known it is consciousness that knows you can say yeah just a minute but i am not omniscient but you are thinking of i am in limitation with this mind and body the same consciousness you the one consciousness functioning through all sentient beings you know the things in this universe somebody might say that yeah but there might be things which no sentient being knows you know there might be a planet far away in the cosmos somewhere no living being is there so don't you think 
that planet exists and uh, it exists outside consciousness? And the one answer is, one simple answer is that, no, but God is there. So God is omniscient. God knows everything. And in God's mind, where all knowledge is there, that's illumined by consciousness, that same I amness. So you as I amness through God's mind, you're omniscient. That kind of argument may be given. A deeper, more profound and subtle argument is this. I mentioned this earlier. You don't have to bring God into it. In one sense, everything is in our consciousness and illumined by our consciousness. Just that some of it is known, some of it is unknown. When you say sarvagyam, all-knowing, it means there's a derivation. You are the all and you are consciousness. Sarvascha, gyascha, all consciousness. The example which I give to Bill, Bill uh, Conrad, I'll repeat it. I've told it many times. I'll say that and finish. It's this, that one day Bill told me, it's not true that everything is in consciousness, Swami. There are things outside consciousness. I'll prove it to you now. So in this room, let's all go out of this room. We'll put a camera in this room and we'll record the room and we'll go out of the room. When we come back into the room, Swami, I will show you the pictures in the camera. You will see a room existing without any conscious being. The room exists outside consciousness. And then we see it. The, what is, this is what is called realism in a philosophical sense. That the world exists and then we come and see it. Now I said to him, Bill, in your consciousness, you saw this room. And in, in, you, in you, the consciousness, you proposed this experiment that let's set, put up a camera here. In you, the consciousness, the camera was set up and switched on. In you, the consciousness, we all you experienced us leaving the room. In you, the consciousness, you experienced us coming back into the room. In you, the consciousness, we experienced the camera showing an empty room, you know, pictures of that. Where did you step outside consciousness? I'll give you one more example. In our dreams, uh, we have the experience of meeting people, doing things, but we also have the intuition of our wider world out there. Follow what I'm saying carefully. In our dreams, suppose we are walking around in Central Park and meeting people, we also have this feeling that I'm in the middle of a world. We feel it's like a waking world. And there's a vast world out there, New York and the United States and the Atlantic Ocean and so on. But I know only a slice of it, this Central Park. They were a little bit in front of me. But when I wake up, what happens? Whatever I saw in the dream, known and unknown, experienced and not experienced, the whole thing was in the dreaming mind, as known and as unknown. So knowledge, which is called prama in Sanskrit, is different from chaitanya, consciousness. Consciousness makes all knowledge possible. Whatever is known and whatever is unknown, it's only in the, in the field of consciousness. So you are, in that sense, sarvagya. And now the author has demonstrated the second uh, definition of Brahman. Brahman is the ground of the entire universe. Uh, the whole universe arises in Brahman, exists in Brahman, disappears back into Brahman. Brahman is the cause of the universe. And has shown you as the I am, the ever-shining I am. The whole universe arises in you, is experienced in you, in you the consciousness, not in you the person and disappears back into you. It is not separate from you. There is not one person here, one object here, one event here which you experience, which is actually anything other than you. You are this universe. This is called non-duality. This is the honey of non-duality. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu